Today we're going to be talking about the humerus or brachium. And of course this is the view of the entire bone. Today we will concentrate on the two ends of this bone. And first we'll talk about the proximal end, the epiphyseal end. In the second video we will talk about the distal epiphyseal end. And I'll mention a little bit about the diaphysis today as well. So let's go ahead and zoom in on the proximal end of the humerus. And right away, we can see that there's a couple of bumps on the humerus. This is the greater tubercle and the lesser tubercle. The greater tubercle of the humerus is the point of insertion for the lion's share of the rotator cuff muscles, whereas the lesser tubercle is the point of insertion for the subscapularis muscle. Between the two tubercles, is a groove which we call the intertubercular groove, inter meaning between. And this is the groove that essentially houses the long head of the biceps brachii uh, muscle. And it also is the point of insertion for the teres major muscle and the pectoralis major muscle. As we spin this a little bit, we see the head of the humerus. And this, of course, is a nice ball and socket joint. And beyond the head here is the neck. And of course we have the surgical neck, which is right here. This is a point of breakage that oftentimes occurs in the humerus, hence the name surgical neck. We're gonna work our way down the shaft of the humerus, that diaphysis, and we'll see this relatively rough area. And that rough area is referred to as the deltoid tuberosity. This is the point of insertion of the deltoid muscle. All right, well, let's gonna go ahead and take a look at the distal end of the humerus. All right, so now we're at the distal end of the humerus, and uh, it's called the humerus, even though there's absolutely nothing funny about this bone. But let's take a look at some of these kind of weird parts of the condylar end here. Um, you can see that this particular piece looks a little bit like a pulley. Let's move that just a little bit. There we go, looks a little bit like a pulley. Indeed, it is named for being a pulley. It's called the trochlea. And this is where we're going to have articulation with the ulna bone. Actually, the coronoid process is going to travel right in here, the coronoid process of the ulna. And so this is referred to, this little depression, as the coronoid fossa. This is something that looks like a little head. And indeed, capitulum, which is the name of this region, is translating, or should be translated to little head. And this is where we also have a small fossa, and that is for the head of the radius. So we call this fossa the radial fossa. On this side, we have the lateral epicondyle. The lateral epicondyle is the point of origin for most of the extensor muscles of the forearm and wrist. And over here, we have the medial epicondyle, which is the point of origin for most of the flexor muscles of the forearm and wrist. All right, so this is the anterior end. Let's spin this over to the posterior side. You will see some of our old friends. This is the medial epicondyle. This is the lateral epicondyle. And we can see the trochlea relatively well, but not the capitulum. We can really see this wonderfully deep depression here. And this is where the olecranon process of the ulna is going to articulate. And so this is referred to as the olecranon fossa. All right, well, a little bit later now, we'll go on to the radius and the ulna.